Yishikoach, Russell. Yishikoach. Thank you so much for that teaching. I um, I've, I got to work with Russell on this Devar Torah and the whole time have been struck by the way, Russell, that you saw something in this Parsha that I've never seen before. The way that Pharaoh's hardened heart um, is, is really about the terrifying feeling of being out of control with our emotions. And um, that insight is gonna stay with me. You showed us that not only is this experience of feeling out of control in our feelings, a universal human experience, but it's also an experience that the Torah tells us God shares with us. And you questioned whether it was okay, whether it was moral for God to artificially impose that or exacerbate that on Pharaoh or within Pharaoh. I have so much I wanna say about this in response to you as I've been afforded the ability during the pandemic to observe and attend to my emotions more deeply than really I think ever before. And I think that might be true for a lot of people. One thing I know for certain is that with or without God's intervention, our feelings are at least part, at least in part out of our control. They wash over us. They emerge from within us. They sometimes overwhelm us. And it doesn't matter what else we have to do that day or whether the timing is convenient or whether they're appropriate to what's happening around us. They come when they come. We can't decide not to have certain feelings or not to have them at certain times. Some emotions are caused by hormones and brain chemistry, which is different for each of us and not in our control. And some emotions are about events long past that emerge suddenly when we're on to other things. Some of them lurk under the surface, creating a vague and murky sense of unease until we can finally pinpoint them and they surface. They last as long as they will last and then they go when they're ready to go. It's not that we have no control, we do as you taught us. In time, we can choose how we want to react to our feelings, whether and how we wanna act on them in the moment or later. We can learn to tolerate even the most difficult and unpleasant feelings. We can observe the relationship between our thoughts and our feelings and see the ways that certain thought patterns or habits of thought can lead to certain emotions. We can learn to accept we can learn to appreciate, we can even learn to love our more difficult emotions, even anger, even fear, even shame, even grief. We can learn that we don't have to be afraid of or reject any emotion. And when we do this, we might even make space for the underlying often unconscious story that we're telling ourselves that leads to the frequency or the set point of certain emotions or moods, better understanding their cause and their origin. We can learn to tell a different story about ourselves and our lives and our world. And we can learn to create different patterns and habits of thought to cultivate emotions that we want like love or gratitude. Judaism both acknowledges the emotionality of the human experience and encourages us, even commands us sometimes, to cultivate particular emotions and to train ourselves away from others. Not only God and Pharaoh are emotional in Torah, so too are all of our ancestors from Genesis through Kings and prophets. In Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, we are commanded not to hate, but to love. And in Pirkei Avot, the rabbis urge us to master anger, hatred, lust, jealousy, and pride. They teach us that we are to use prayer and study and mitzvot. And mitzvot are specific other-oriented, other-focused actions to train ourselves to manage our most difficult emotions. It isn't that we're expected to root them out of ourselves. We, we are not, and that wouldn't be possible and it wouldn't be healthy. But we are encouraged to learn how not to act on them and how to habituate ourselves away from them toward humility, toward kindness, and toward peace specifically. An entire strand of Jewish teaching called Musar, developed in the 19th century, is designed to help us develop and balance our character traits, intentionally cultivating those qualities and emotions that lead us to do good in the world. Lahavdil, in contrast, as you taught us, 
Russell and Shemot Rabbah, the rabbis, Shimon, uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Rish Lakish, teaches that Pharaoh got so used to hardening his own heart, to making himself callous and unfeeling for years and years and years. He had so reinforced that tendency in his own consciousness not to feel compassion, not to reflect, not to feel regret, that he didn't need any help from God to harden his own heart in response to the first five plagues. Only on plague six did God begin to interfere and contribute to the hardening. This is an important lesson for all of us about the way feelings can become habits and how habits can become entrenched unless we con consciously shift them and how we might use the limited control that we do have to change our habits of thought and feeling through intention and through repetition. But even with all of that, being emotional, being human, and according to Torah, being godly is about being a little bit out of control. Even when it comes to our own mood, even when it comes to our own heart and mind, you would think that the ability to control our inner state should belong to us and only to us, but it does not. And your Devar Torah, Russell, made me wonder whether God's interference in Pharaoh's inner state isn't simply descriptive of the experience we all have of that lack of control. This Wednesday was a glorious day on which we saw that our democracy has survived, on which we saw capable and compassionate leadership return, on which we glimpsed a vision of the country we can become. I talked with a number of people on or after Inauguration Day who expressed surprise that along with their joy and inspiration and relief, they felt a strange sadness or a heaviness or a weariness. We may find that we have leftover emotions from the last four years, emotions we couldn't fully feel because we were so busy coping. Anger, sorrow, despair even, grief. We lived through something terrible and terrifying. And it would be natural if there were feelings to be felt afterward, maybe even a long time afterward. I would submit that the last four years set us into an unhealthy emotional pattern of tension, fear, panic even, dread, heightened reactivity and sense of threat, anger, rage even, and hatred. We have been besieged. We have been abused for four years. And it is time now to consciously change the pattern and the habit of our thoughts and feelings, to pay attention to healing ourselves, to calm our bodies, to notice when we jump to the worst conclusions, when we catastrophize that which is not a catastrophe, when we hate readily or are inflamed into anger with little provocation. And when we notice this reaction, we can gently ask ourselves whether the reaction fits the facts. And if the reaction doesn't fit the facts, we can gently soothe ourselves and reorient ourselves. It is time to find a new set point, to lower our internal temperature. That is what Jews use Shabbat for every single week, even without a near slide into white nationalist fascism. Every week has its stresses. Every week we need a day to breathe, a day to calm ourselves a day to remember the actual context in which we live, the vast universe in which we spin, the brief glorious experience of being alive, the full set of wonders and blessings from which we benefit. To remember gratitude, to remember love, to remember simple miracles, to sing, which deepens our breathing and calms our nervous system to recontextualize our moment in eternality, to recontextualize ourselves in all humanity, to recontextualize our souls within all being, within the interconnection of all souls. I'm not suggesting that the work of our nation is complete. I am not. I'm not suggesting that there aren't real pressing dangers now and urgent needs. Of course there are. It is precisely because there is so much work to do that we need to care for our inner state, to attend to our emotions, 
we will have so much more to give. We will have, we will last so much longer if we can recenter ourselves in a calmer, more peaceful, more hopeful, more loving state. This was extremely difficult for us to do in the last four years, but now it is newly possible. When we feel less threatened, when we start to feel that there's a bit of safety, we can start to dream. We can start to dream of our visions for our country and our own contributions to those visions. This week, we released CBEs and Union Temple's pledge to the people's inauguration. The idea of the people's inauguration is that a president and an administration cannot make all the changes that our country needs without the support and a groundswell, a groundswell from the people. So for 10 days, communities all across America are making a pledge to do our part to bring about the world that should be. And CBE's Covenant with America was written by members who attended Friday night services last week on Martin Luther King Shabbat. The link has, I think, been copied into the chat now. And I encourage you to read it at, at your leisure and to consider what your personal pledge will be to this covenant and to our country. On Inauguration Day, the poet Amanda Gorman spoke to the relationship between the difficult emotions of these last four years and the work that lies ahead. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I know that we are brave enough to be it. And as you said, Russell, who knows? We might just surprise ourselves and do something amazing. Shabbat shalom.